Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's so nice to see all of you here. Um, yes, welcome to the second in the Tech in the Time of Coronavirus series. Um, this is the San Francisco Technology Salon um, coming to you globally. And the, the focus of today's salon is what are COVID-19 responses for refugees in low-income countries? And we're so excited about the discussion we're going to have today. As you know, tech salons are typically in person, typically quite small, limited to about 35 people. Um, and as we are opening it up to virtual, it does give us some good opportunities to bring in some great voices from the field. So we're really excited about that today. Uh, tech salons have been running for about 10 years, including in Washington, DC, New York, uh, San Francisco, Bangkok, London, Helsinki, and Lusaka. And they're aimed at bringing together the tech sector and the development humanitarian sector so that we can discuss and debate shared challenges and improve our work and really find solutions together. We're trying to break down silos. Um, so what we try to do is really be unlike typical conferences or even webinars. We try to really engage discussion as much as possible. We're trying to make it be more like the conversation you'd have in a side meeting or you know if you if you go to a bar after the conference or if you are you know just walking through the aisles when you're, you get to be really yourself uh, i've been organizing salons in san francisco for the past four years about we've got folks here who run other salons in other cities including way and vota who started tech salons originally that, that linda raftery has been behind um, this whole series she is uh, leads the tech salons in new york and then also here in san francisco josh ryman it has been helping um, pull off these tech salons. Uh, we've also got some great support from ThoughtWorks here. So Andy McWilliams has been providing a lot of support as well for this. So this is our second salon. And this salon is sponsored by Vodafone America's Foundation. They sponsor technology salons throughout the San Francisco Bay Area and have for a really long time. It is produced by Invenio, um, a wonderful nonprofit working to enable connectivity throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. This series is, is partnered with ThoughtWorks, Pivotal, and Dial, and we'll be working with other organizations as well on other themes and topics. So as I mentioned, this is the second in the series. The first salon was last Thursday, and the report and video of the first salon, How Can the Tech Sector Respond to, the, to COVID-19, is available online. There's a great video and a great write-up of that salon, but really it was focused on um, stage setting and framing uh, with a discussion of how the tech sector can res respond to COVID-19. In that salon, we brought together the tech sector with the public health and humanitarian sector for learning from past crises like Ebola and where, when, why, how tech was useful or not useful. Today's salon offers a chance to learn about the current situation and COVID-19 responses in three countries, Uganda, Ghana, and Pakistan, and among three communities, refugees, nonprofit organizations, and the news media. Actually, before we move on, I'd love to give June Sugiyama a chance to introduce herself and share a little bit more about why she supports technology salons in Vodafone America's foundation. Hi, everybody. Good morning for me here in Oakland, California. Um, you know, in this new extraordinary times, for some of us, it's an advantage to be able to work at home. And um, for me, especially, I don't have the hour and a half commute to uh, go down south and I get time to spend with my family. But as you all know, for some, the reality um, becomes even more difficult, um, especially when it has to do with the online or you know accessing the internet and so forth. And for me in my position, that's what I've been trying to imp impress upon to our folks within my company to think about um, you know, the latest and the greatest and, um, you know, we have access to this and uh, we can do work at home and so forth. And when we create new technology to think about um, what it is for the people who don't have access or who don't have the technology as readily as we would like. And so when we get a chance to be able to access a little bit of technology that you all are working on, what incredible things can be done. And that's, that's what I try to impress on my folks. So I believe um, these series are really, really timely. And people like all of us are, have always been ready and willing. And so 
I'm really glad to be a part of this and thank you for your time today. Thank you, June. Really appreciate it. So just a little bit about what to expect today. For the first half, the first 45 minutes, we're going to have three discussion leads and a really brief like one to two questions Q&A. Um, this part is going to be recorded and publicly available. The second 45 minutes will be moderated breakout discussions. This is Chatham House rules off the record. So do not attribute or repeat names of organizations of anything that is said. And just so we have some guidelines for really solutions focused here. We aim to get people together, share challenges and learn. Bring yourself and your open mind just as you are. If it's morning where you are, eat breakfast. We do that at salons. Um, if it's lunchtime, eat lunch if you want to. Um, be yourself. Uh, try not to pitch, um, but do share resources that are helpful for the group. No acronyms, or if you have to use them, please define them. Ask questions and connect with others in the chat. Next, we're going to turn to the discussion leads, and I'm just going to introduce them quickly. And just before we start, so many of you guys could be discussion leads today. So I'm just really impressed with the turnout that we've gotten and the group that we have. Um, so but, but especially pleased that we have uh, Nana Afajinu uh, videoing in from Accra, Ghana. She's the executive director of the West Africa Civil Society Institute, WAXI. Um, and we also have Irfan Yunus videoing in from Islamabad, Pakistan. He is the ICT specialist, chief executive officer of KCC Communication. And also Mike Zuckerman, often called Zuck, who is dialing or videoing in from just outside Nakavele refugee settlement near Lake Moro, Uganda. He's a creative activist and applied geographer, and we'll start off with Zuck. All right, thank you. Um, I was told not to be backlit, so here I am in full sunshine. Uh, <laughs> my name is Mike Zuckerman. I'm a creative activist for TO.org. Uh, doing research and development and field work uh, for displaced people. I've been spending most of my time in the last few years in Uganda because I believe they have some of the most progressive policies towards refugees and therefore if you create a model that could be used in other countries. Um, I've been to over 80 refugee camps in many different countries. Uh, so that does make me experienced, but it does not make me either an expert who knows exactly what to do or the hero of this story. My main focus is plainly to put resources and decision-making into the hands of refugees themselves uh, and the beneficiaries. I believe that the local response is uh, the best. Uh, I believe in the wisdom of the crowds. Uh, I think that you, know, you see like at the county fair when you have a bowl and a glass jar and you have everyone put in a guess, the average is always better than the bowl experts. And the same thing happens with like the Challenger space shuttle um, disaster. The stock market knew which companies uh, were to fault before the actual information came out. So I believe that you know the many is always better than the few. Uh, however, the humanitarian system is largely set up for the few to be making decisions for the many, often from a far distance away. Uh, I believe in this concept of distributed everything, uh, both in power generation and decision making and uh, um, energy creation and uh, some of these technology concepts over the last 20, 30 years that have really advanced uh, online interactions are still lagging behind in the physical realm, including open source and uh, user generated content. So uh, some of my work involves, and there's actually someone on the call here, Joel, who I worked with in Greece, where we kind of flipped the humanitarian model on its head and let refugees and volunteers build their own refugee camp in Greece. And it was largely considered the most dignified and uh, you know, good living situation. And it wasn't built by NGOs, it was built by refugees and volunteers themselves. I truly believe in this locally led uh, movement. So to the situation here uh, now in Uganda, uh, I was here responding to crises both displacement from, um, from Congo. There were over 10,000 uh, people who arrived uh, in the course of a month and they don't have uh, adequate shelter and they certainly don't have water. Uh, it's very difficult to wash your hands if you don't have access to water. So we've been trying to deal with that before COVID and now that COVID comes, uh, it's another crisis. And that's you know just representative of these other crises don't go away. And you know, we, 
vulnerable populations around the world are even more susceptible to COVID. Um, I know we just saw uh, an ex uh, announcement that in Lebanon yesterday, there was the first case in a Palestinian camp. Um, and this seems to be like an affluent uh, virus or, you know, that, that affects the, the more globally connected places first. So these more vulnerable populations are lagging behind a bit, but I'm still very concerned as to what uh, is going to happen there. So um, in some ways, uh, Uganda and other places around here in East Africa are prepared for uh, COVID because they have experience with Ebola. Um, however, the economic situation is a completely different story. Uh, there's already hashtags appearing of like hunger pandemic. Uh, I even saw a really horrific uh, video today in uh, Kampala. There was a, a woman with her kids out on the street saying, you know, please like arrest me. I, at least at jail, there'll be food for me and my kids. And she said she's going to stay on the streets until the sun goes down and violate the, the, um, violate the curfew because then at least she'll be taken in by the community or by uh, the government. So it's pretty scary what's going on. Um, that's definitely a big part of the issue. Um, the other thing is that solutions that are and, and advice that's coming from w, uh, WHO and other things, uh, WHO have been not necessarily for uh, populations that are living in uh, the inner cities and in uh, the refugee camps. Social distancing is next to impossible. You have 12 people living in a room at times. And another example, we talked to the uh, uh, kind of infectious disease experts, and they're saying things like, uh, you know, bleach and water is a last resort and only for healthcare professionals. But when you don't have access to soap, it's really the only option. Uh, another example is places people don't have soap to even wash their clothes. So yes, it's important to wash your hands, but if you can't wash your clothes for an entire week, you're going to be you know, a vector for the disease, disease as well. So we've been uh, supporting local groups to make uh, bar soap so that they can use it to wash their hands and their clothes. Um, so it's, it's difficult to know what solution is actually working. And that's where I wanted to introduce a project that we're working on in order to evaluate our effectiveness in uh, COVID response. I work with um, a, a partnership with Alight, which is the former American Refugee Committee and they've created a program called Kuja Kuja. K-U-J-A space K-U-J-A. It means come, come in Swahili. And it's essentially a customer feedback mechanism where they pull the customers, they call them, the refugees, the residents of these camps on a, a question. Are you happy with the current response? Are you uh, aware of COVID? Are you uh, aware of the symptoms of COVID? And then there's, after the, the binary yes or no question, there's a, a chance for people to say what they would do and to get local answers, real time, data based, uh, based on what the decision or what, what the current factors are. For example, in the beginning of this crisis, people weren't aware of it. When I was in the camp, it had already started in San Francisco and New York where my family and friends are, but no one was aware of it in the camp. I even heard leadership in the camp saying that, uh, that black people get Ebola and white people get Corona. And this was leadership of the camp. And this is in, you know, in April. Um, so there's a lot of uh, information that we're getting based on deciding if we need to spend more on uh, education and awareness or we need to do more of the uh, hand washing and you know water distribution and such. So uh, most of our solutions are analog at this point but having this data layer, data layer is incredibly important and uh, very useful. So uh, in, in closing uh, some of the things to be optimistic about Partnerships are happening more. Uh, people are less worried about risk. Uh, they're kind of saying, we, we just need to go for it. And the other thing that I'm seeing more and more of is large NGOs and even UNHCR are putting resources into refugees' hands because they're having difficult accessing the country, moving throughout the country. They're really having to turn over a lot of this decision-making and uh, resources to the refugees themselves. And I think that that's the way forward for the next decades as we're dealing with displacement. And if COVID is a chance to spark that and to show the efficacy of local decisions, uh, I think we're going to see a lot more, um, you know, uh, resilient approach to dealing with displaced people. Thanks so much. So I really appreciate what you said. Um, and I wanted to ask if there, if you have more ways in which um, you can share that 
communities will need support to improve resilience. Yeah, it's kind of this uh, paradox, you know, as I kind of mentioned in the beginning, uh, we need to do more, uh, but also the solutions need to come from the beneficiaries themselves. Uh, it's a really complicated thing. I don't have to fully get into around privilege, uh, but, but in order for a resilient to solution to come out, I think our role is more in a uh, supportive role. And that's where technology can really be a tool. Instead of saying, here's how you have to do things, it's more, here's access to something. For example, uh, Kuja Kuja can't be in the field anymore because they've been deemed non-essential. So they're developing things like a chat bot for WhatsApp and other things like that that can help uh, get information out and collect data. Uh, but again, I think it's really uh, just worthy to note that people know what solutions they need. Uh, it's more about not having access to resources, financial, uh, agency, um, technology, all of those things. And there are some people who have um, negative connotations about chatbots and that kind of thing. Um, and I wanted to ask you, you know, what would you say in response um, if there were to be um, artificial intelligence use of uh, WhatsApp chat um, for that community? I mean, information is the biggest thing. I'm also uh, formerly worked in uh, Kutu Palong in Bangladesh, the largest refugee camp in the world. They haven't had technology. They've had their phones turned off for the last three, four months. So rumors are completely rampant. So um, chatbots may not be uh, perfect and I'm not familiar with the uh, criticism necessarily, but I think in a, a time where information and, and correct information is crucial uh, and also casting a wide net, um, some of them are a little less uh, AI natural language style that there is a 1-800 uh, number now that has been set up that people can be using the Kuja Kuja service. They collected over 10,000 numbers in the first week. Um, and we've been putting those uh, numbers on hand washing points around the camp and we're getting uh, lots of people really interested in participating because again, they're, they're concerned and they don't feel that they have all the accurate information and they're using technology in order uh, as a trusted source of getting the good information instead of from people's mouths. Thank you so much, Seth. That was so helpful. Appreciate it. And I know we'll have more questions for you. I want to turn it over to Nana um, over in Accra to share about her perspective on civil society and nonprofits and the, the response there throughout West Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's great to be here and to have this conversation with you all. Um, well, it's been an interesting time for civil society, interesting positively and negatively. Um, I would say that particularly civil society has found itself um, in a space where, to some extent, we are a bit helpless because many of the organizations in this region engage their communities face to face. Um, a lot of the work that we do is meeting people, conferences, engaging, marching on the streets, demonstrating. Yeah, I mean, so there's, there's, a, there's a lot of that. Now all our work has to move online. Um, we are compelled to work virtually, uh, work remotely. And so that has clearly shown what the gaps are and that we need to fill. And I want to talk about two particular ones. Um, I mean, I'm sure I, I, we don't have time to talk about the context, but um, we, we, we do have a challenge, um, a peculiar challenge when it comes, it comes here to Africa um, because you have a large number of people who are, would you would put in the vulnerable brackets. Um, and government alone cannot take care um, of, of their needs within this time. And so civil society um, wants to play a huge role in doing that, but is also constrained um, in a number of ways. Now, when it comes to tech, because we are working online, um, there are a number of things that we are facing. One is that Many organizations do not have the tools, the hardware, the software, they don't have the skills, the knowledge or the expertise to work remotely. And, and, and a number of organizations do use, I mean, they have computers. 
many of them are, are, are desktops. I mean, if you're working remotely, you don't have um, computers in every home that people work, you know, would, have, would, would be able to work with. And they don't have laptops. And so that is really challenging um, in, in, in that sense. We have a very high penetration of, of mobile telephony. And so that is one of the key tools um, that people have been, have been using. There are other constraints. There are data constraints, and that, that's related to costs of data, which is extremely expensive, um, accessibility. You have issues with internet connectivity. It's poor, it's weak. In some places, it's completely absent. Um, now, even though I've talked about the high mobile penetration, we do have um, the, a number of key interventions and engagements going on right now and that do not necessarily use uh, mobile technology. A lot of it is, is web-based. Um, and so that cuts out quite a, a huge number of nonprofit organizations that may be able to participate in some of the meetings that we are having, like, like this one right now. The issue about digi digital security. I mean, a number of organizations, um, the work that they do is sensitive, Governments, and I'm speaking uh, widely, I mean, across the region now, when it comes to protecting um, civic space and, and making sure that the, 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 the work that we do is secure. Digital security, being secure from government surveillance and being secure um, from hackers. Both, there are challenges um, with that. We need to have accurate data. We should be able to collate data and analyze data. And having the tech tools to enable us to do that in a time like this is essential. This is also challenging for several organizations. So that are the tech deficiencies and challenges. Then you have the funding challenges. Um, many of the organizations have no reserves. They live virtually, <laughs> like I said, the majority of people live. They live hand to mouth. It's a survival issue. And they live from project to project. Many of the, the funding that, that they get does not allow them to build reserves. And for even several of these, this kind of funding, it, does, it goes to support projects and not to build their institutions. And so you can really see the gap now. I mean, you can see that they, 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 are, they don't have the resilience um, in, in, a time, in a time like this. Um, where we don't have flexible donors, there are a few donors that have come up that have talked about, I mean, they are flexible. They want to look at even how to maybe even turn around the, the grants that they've given into core funding instead of projects. Some want to look at how to support the organizations. Um, some, no. I have not even have had that discussion. And there are also discussions going on in silos. You have INGOs talking to each other, NGOs, and then you have the donors. So that connection is also um, not there and, and a lot needs to be done. And that for many of our, of, 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 of our countries, there's no government financial stimulus that can serve as a cushion for nonprofit organizations, even in the short and medium term, there's nothing. Um, several of these organizations are stuck in log frames and deadlines. They don't have a lot of room to maneuver. So there is that real fear that if we do not get out of this situation very soon, many organizations will not exist, um, even if um, they are doing very good work, because they would lose their staff, they would lose their assets um, and what it is that they have. and, and and the organization would have to close down. So th those are some of the real fears. Now, uh, to improving resilience, there are a number of things that is needed. Um, technology capacity, clearly, I've talked about it. The need to have the kind of capacity, technology capacity that in a time like this can help one to still mobilize support, continue networking, continue programming that meets the needs of people. Um, looking at the funding capacity and, and, and having long-term partnerships um, that really strengthen organizations. Um, you know, that, that is, is something that, that is important. Data, to have the data capacity um, to be able to know 
um, what, what needs to be done um, in a time like this and the human resource capacity. These are all some of the things. Now, what is working so far? Um, mobile money uh, has been very effective. And so you have civil society organizations that have come together to um, collect and collect money and have a fund to support vulnerable people. And many are using mobile money, apart from online transfers, many are using mobile money. The challenge with some of the organizations is that because they are working online, they have a ch and they don't have tools to have um, their approvals, procurement, and, and um, financial approvals online, that presents a challenge in kind of having funding to give. But you have individuals who are giving, using mobile money, um, giving, giving uh, money. Communication using tools like the phone, whether it's a smartphone or not. WhatsApp has been brilliant, Skype, um, Teams, has been very useful for those that use Teams, Hangouts, Zoom, they, all those have been very helpful. Um, cloud tools like Google Drive, Office 365, Box, Dropbox, there are organizations that have this, that are using this. But even with this, what is not working, as I've already said, the high cost of internet, and the increase in communication tariffs that has made it, you know, lack of laptops for different organizations, um, lack of training or expertise to effectively use available tools. So if you are using Teams, Zoom, Skype for collaboration, some encounter challenges because that's not something they've been using already and need to have that training. Uh, the limitation of free trial versions of available tools is one of the challenges. Um, so uh, they don't have paid versions. They are, they are able to use um, the tools only for a limited time. So that, that for those that are able to use it, that is one of the, the, the areas. And if we want to look at what could be helpful uh, for urgent and long-term resilience, I think tech organizations and network service providers, the private sector um, would have to look at increasing their support for civil society. A lot of the support now is mainly going to government. So uh, uh, they need to look at the nonprofit sector as well, particularly in, in West Africa, which I mean, I know a lot more of. There needs to be a lot more support going to civil society. Um, sharing tech expertise and tools to build capacity you know, uh, that would be very useful. Now, how can communities innovate technology uh, for greater impact? We need to look at innovative technology that enables us to use less data because of the costs, because of accessibility. Um, it would be good to look at tools that use less data, tools that enable uh, virtual wor uh, working, mobile, uh, you know, uh, technology and connecting communities in languages they can understand. So you, that would be brilliant. It would be very useful. Um, in Ghana, we, we are told, because we've just heard the news, um, that they are using drones, for example, to deliver some of the material that has to get to critical places like test kits. Um, in rural areas. Now that is brilliant. Um, and if we could have more of this in many of our countries, that would be very useful. Data collection tools um, that, that, that civil society could use. Digital security tools that are easy to use um, would be, would be uh, very useful. And so how to help? I would think mobile, uh, I mean, more training and educational support. Looking at marketing and outreach on office and how um, organizations can be supported during this period. So give special discounts and donation offers that can enable organizations offset these costs um, of IT. Um, if there's a possibility to give grants to low budget or organizations with special needs, yes, let's do this. How, how can organizations uh, work with local tech organizations or individuals that have the interest in this to create context usable tools um, that can enable uh, efficiency and e effectiveness um, in working during this, this time and this period. I think these are all some of the areas that we could look at and discuss further. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. I really appreciate it. 
what you share really shows how in this particular crisis, technology is, is truly an enabler of, of survival for many of these nonprofits and is, is helping them to make decisions, critical decisions about their future, um, the ability to collaborate, continue meeting, that kind of thing. Um, I see a question coming in from Josh Ryman, one of the other organizers of the San Francisco Salon. Um, go ahead. Hi, Nana. Um, Hi, Josh. I just, I, I know that, um, you know, WACSI is in, I believe, 17 countries in West Africa and has also, also participates in some civil society networks um, like TechSoup um, out there. Can you talk a little bit about what uh, specifically WACSI is doing uh, with that network and also if there are specific ways that you are looking for uh, partnerships, whether they're short term or long term, like you mentioned? Uh, which are needed uh, from uh, partners outside Ghana. And we just have 90 seconds for this answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I mean, the main thing is we are reaching out to organizations to say, look, there are tools available that you can use. So at least give information um, for those that can take advantage of it. The challenge is that for those that even want to ac acquire some of this software, um, and tools online, they have a procurement challenge because they are working from home, they are not able to get the approvals, and you know, so that in itself is a challenge, but that is one. The other thing is, is supporting with training, and um, for those that are, you know, going, using cloud services, um, that is the other support that we are giving. We think that more tech capacity for organizations will be critical now and post-COVID. And we would want to, we would want uh, that kind of uh, partnership with organizations to, to, to provide that kind of capacity for civil society. So I'm sure my 90 seconds is up, but that, that, those are the areas that I think it would be good to, to, to help and, and support. Thank you so much, Nana, appreciate it. Uh, okay, we're gonna turn over to Irfan now in Islamabad to share about the news media and the situation there. I'm Mirfan Yunus, uh, working with the various communication projects. And currently we are working in Pakistan uh, in a situation for a country uh, over 200 million population and had no experience for such an outbreak in their history. This is the very first time that this nation is exposed with such a large number and, and devastated impact of a, a pandemic. Um, so far, uh, the, the, uh, the cases are increasing in Pakistan, which is a matter of worry. And uh, government and uh, the healthcare system uh, is testing now how to cope the situation and how to handle all these uh, situation in upcoming days. Uh, the, some of uh, the background of the Pakistan, I think that would be really good for you, so if you are familiar with that, so you can imagine how uh, uh, media and non-profit are working here and how government is responding to that. Uh, that's social distancing and uh, personal hygiene is the two uh, major points to prevent this COVID-19 outbreak and all these uh, negative impact. Social distancing is a real challenge because it's culturally and religiously inculcating in this society from, from so many decades since the, this country exists. So uh, when this outbreak has come, there is so misconceptions and uh, myth bursters are there. So initially it was a real challenge uh, for uh, the civil society organization and particularly uh, the communication organization to deal with that. So uh, fortunately, the organization like Equal Access International is implementing one of the projects and we are, they are partnering with them. So they are bringing mass awareness about that. So the information, uh, the real time information about the COVID-19 was the real issue uh, in, in June and Feb. The reason is that, that Pakistan is a neighbor country of the China 
And the Chinese influence is uh, much higher than in Pakistan as compared to any other country. And so many mega projects of uh, Chinese government is funding it here. So it was a fear that uh, their uh, uh, dissemination and increase of cases will be higher than as compared to any other country. Fortunately, it was not exported from there, but now it is exporting from various countries. And uh, the most reason behind that is the religious visits, the pilgrimage of Iran and some other countries they are coming to Pakistan and it's export, export here. So now this is the situation. Uh, the healthcare uh, workers are uh, very, very much concerned about the relaxation of the government in lockdown in the upcoming month uh, of Ramzan. Ramzan is a holy month for the Muslims and this is the 98% uh, Muslims are inhabiting in this country. So the congregational ceremonies are expecting, the huge gathering are expecting in this country in the upcoming month, which is started from the 25th of April. So coping with that situation, it's also the responsibility of the civil society, but mostly with, with the government and the religious leaders. And uh, last week, the association of the healthcare uh, workers they warn the government and the people that if these congregational ceremonies are going on in, in Ramzan, in, in, in Ramadan, so it will be a real challenge for the healthcare system uh, to manage all these patients uh, because uh, there is a weak health system uh, in Pakistan. Uh, so this is uh, the situation regarding increasing the cases. The opportunity, every uh, challenge is, is opportunity as well. The civil society of the Pakistan was not that much prepared uh, before the COVID-19 to digitally respond to any social issue. Although World Bank and some UN agencies are, are working uh, with Pakistani government to digitalize the business, the business and the economy and all these things. But how to respond digitally, I think this is the first time that so many uh, organization and representative of the civil society uh, thinking, start thinking that now it's the time uh, to respond and, the ICT, uh, and to utilize ICT solutions for all these mass awareness, information, education, mobilization, and particularly how to inspire them. The reason is that, that I said to you, this is uh, stereotypes. You can say that it's a cultural or religious, that uh, half of the population is not yet uh, sensitized how uh, devastated uh, this outbreak is. So uh, this is also an opportunity that the ICT solution is now uh, seeking from the civil society and the government uh, government launch uh, uh, right now a SAS program is a social uh, protection program, one of the biggest social protection program in the history of the Pakistan. And it's, it's all on a data portal. Although uh, World Bank support Pakistan government, but I, but I think that uh, uh, through this government reach to more than 70 million population who are the daily wagers, and they are badly affected from this lockdown because uh, mostly the Pakistan economy is informal and the daily wager is associated with this. Uh, with this. So this is uh, the very good step of the government that they start uh, uh, a digital uh, response to the COVID-19 and this lockdown effect. So now they uh, disperse uh, cash price and the Russian distribution through uh, a portal where they collect the data from the communities and then they respond through various uh, government institutes. So this is, uh, uh, yes, this is the response of the government. And uh, I, will, I will must say that there are so many ICT solution in this country. And uh, the opportunity is that, that we have 64% youth population in this country which is for my information is this is one of the leading country that they have the youth population at that, at that much ratio.
so they are using the social media they are using the gsm uh, polls as well uh, 140 million is uh, the uh, confirmed data with the pakistan telecommunication authority that they are the gsm users so the interactive voice response system ivr can be very effectively be utilized to inform them and to collect the data and to share with the civil society with the government for further action and all these things. So this is one of the ICT solutions that civil society can utilize. Uh, we, do, we utilize all these uh, ICT solutions and particularly the interactive wise response systems, not for the COVID-19, but some other CV programming uh, in, in, in the conflict zone of, of the Pakistan. So this is uh, one of the opportunities and uh, the the social media user particularly the facebook is much higher in pakistan and there is uh, the two studies are there the one says that up to 37 million user and the another is the 42 million user of the facebook so uh, nowadays this traditional uh, radio uh, component which is socially acceptable uh, in pakistan is become a Facebook live and YouTube upload uh, sort of segments. So this is a very powerful, you can say that it's a, a mixtures of uh, the traditional media with the social media and it's now become, that's why it's a new media. So the new media is playing vital role to inform uh, the rural population through radio, the youth through social media and the urban population through the FM station and all these things. Thank you so much. Hey, Irfan, yeah. Thank um, you. just a, a, a quick follow up. Is there, um, you mentioned that uh, radio is, is kind of the most powerful um, uh, communication platform in the rural communities. Um, is that the, uh, can you talk a little bit about the most trusted forms of technology amongst the religious community, if it, if it is kind of, specifically around radio or if there are other kinds of technologies that generally the religious community is comfortable with? Uh, yeah, uh, Josh, uh, this is a very good question. The reason is that, that why radio is socially acceptable, particularly in, Afghanistan, uh, in Pakistan and some part of the uh, Afghanistan, uh, because there is no picture and there is a stereotype in, in, a, in, in the majority faith that it's haram. So the religious leaders uh, very usually and particularly the religious leader living in the rural part uh, accept this radio as the, as the media tool. And they are also utilizing their FM station to communicate with the uh, communities. Uh, but nowadays these social media trends also attract them. And so many religious leaders have their uh, pages, uh, Facebook and YouTube. But radio is still is a socially acceptable for the religious leaders. And if you want to communicate with the women, uh, the reason is that, uh, that uh, women in Pakistan, they have only access in the rural part to the radio uh, because there is no video, no uh, picture is associated with that. So these two segment of the society, if you want to communicate with them, radio is still is very much acceptable. Uh, but trending, and I mentioned that, that the youth population is very much uh, attractive to the social media. Thank you so much, Irfan. This is great. And we are about to go into breakout rooms where we'll be able to go even deeper and, uh, and really talk through more questions.